Welcome, everyone, to another edition of 45 Forward, where our mission is to help you, our listeners, from Los Angeles to Long Island, make the second half of life even better than the first. After two trying years, we appear to be making a fitful transition from a tumultuous pandemic to an almost normal endemic, at least for now. But what lessons have we really learned from this crisis? Do we have effective strategies to recover from this continuing pandemic or the economic and social disruption caused by COVID, especially as we get older and more vulnerable? Are we better prepared to handle future crises, whether natural disasters or man-made political conflicts now roiling across the world? In today's episode, Linda Fostek, a best-selling author and crisis planning consultant, and Don Patain, a veteran financial advisor, offer their collective wisdom on how to prepare for potential crises, as well as recover from them when they unavoidably land on us. Linda is the creator of a comprehensive crisis planning guide designed to help people protect their homes and loved ones from a range of disasters, from violent storms to cyber fraud. She helps families assemble customized in case of emergency toolkits to deal with the challenging what ifs in life and stop worrying about them. Don specializes in long-term financial planning for everyone from young newlyweds to older retirees who now face the sudden impact of potential inflation. Often referring to himself as a financial doctor who does house calls, Don will talk about how he works with a network of professionals to help families create strategies to address needs and potential crises through every stage of life, from general investment and college planning to life insurance, long-term care, and funeral pre-planning. And beyond individual preparedness, Linda and Don will talk about how communities can come together in times of crises, providing needed support and recovery processes that often take longer than we ever thought. So let's meet our guests now, Linda Fostek and Don Patain. Linda and Don, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's Thank you for inviting to be me. Here. <laughs> yeah. And to Linda, I'd say welcome back because I've had you on the show previously and I'm yes. glad to have you back. You have a lot of great things to say. So guys, uh, coming uh, out of the pandemic into the endemic, uh, we can uh, talk about the lessons we've learned regarding pl crisis planning preparation. But first, I want if, just let's, let's take a look at where we are now. Give me a sense of what you guys think of as the state of affairs, you know, what's been the total pandemic, how are we doing financially, socially, psychologically? What are the biggest concerns uh, in this recovery period from the crisis? So let me start with you, Linda. Let's go. Well, I think the thing that I think has shocked us all uh -huh. is just how long it's taken us to get through this current crisis, this pandemic. Um, and the long-term effects and long-term um, impact on our lives that this particular pandemic has had on us has, it crosses all age groups and all socioeconomic people. It truly, um, I'm looking at people who are still terrified to go outside. Mm -hmm. They haven't even been out to a grocery store or a restaurant in over two years. Um, you know, uh, th they are absolutely terrified and it has completely changed the way they're living their lives and not living their lives because they're not able to like kind of get back into it, even though, you know, for the most part, Many of us feel like it's behind us mm -hmm. and we're putting it behind us. There are still many that are, you know, they're not comfortable. Um, the media has done such an incredible job of making everybody so <laughs> afraid of, of even shaking hands with an individual or, or seeing their family or, you know, or going to a restaurant. It's, it's absolutely, I find it very interesting how the media has really instilled this fear in people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it goes far beyond what's rational at this point, yeah. at least and, in my, my right. point of view. Right. I mean, I, I, from their point of view, they're thinking I'm crazy because, you know, I, I am immunocompromised and, and I go out to restaurants and I go to meetings and I, I have a an act, very active life. Mm -hmm. And you know, my my philosophy is just if, if your immune system isn't challenged, your immune system doesn't know how to react when faced with mm -hmm. a novel mm -hmm. virus. Right. So I, I kind of believe that I need to be exposed to things in order to keep my immune system active. And a lot right. of other people feel they have to isolate. And then the first time they do go out, that's when they get sick. 
I don't right. know. Yeah. Really scary. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, the dot, you know, so I think that, you know, there, there's sort of general um, reactions. What about financially? I mean, it's really been disruptive to a lot of people from jobs to, you know, workplace, you know, dislocation and coming back and not coming back. And, but also just financially, people I think are unsure about it. So what, what's been your, your assessment of how people, where people are? Well, I, it's interesting because I have I have found that my my clients mm-hmm. uh, who are is a combination of, of industries that they're in, that um, other than the fact that you know they've been concerned about the pandemic itself, they they have continued to work some remotely, some mm-hmm. hands on, um, and um, thank God I've had no one that has panicked. <clears throat> I've had no one who need needed any money from their accounts, other than a couple of people that they were buying a house and so on and so forth. But other than that, there was no one that that needed the money to to live on every day. And and I guess I got to say I've got clients they they kind of lucked out. But yeah. that in 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 general though, I I guess that was not the norm. There right. were a lot of people who were affected by by this and lost their jobs and so on but like i said no one of my clients right have right. lost their jobs yeah so. yeah well i think that that's one of the interesting things as linda started to say it's been a really disparate impact and it's hard to really assess sometimes but i think one of the things you started to mention which i know that linda and i have talked about in the past is just this notion of panic <laughs> and i think that you've uh, i think one of your uh, good metaphors is from your experience in scuba diving right Yes, you know, because I mean, one of the first things they teach you in scuba diving is that panic kills. Mm -hmm. And when you panic, invariably, you make the wrong decision. And that's what we all, that's what planning tries to avoid. Mm -hmm. Because when you plan well, whether it's for your financial planning, or whether it's for just all the different aspects of planning, organizing your paperwork and knowing where everything is and having everything together that it's grab and go if if you do have say a natural disaster that you can actually get your hands on the information you need in order to recover that is just that is so important to truly allow you to make the right decisions in the face of great difficulty and you know, a lot of people were not in any position to handle a two-year pandemic, mm-hmm. which many people were out of work for at least a full year of that time. Um, you know, not everybody was fortunate right. enough to be able to work from home, um, and some people were, you know, their their businesses were shut down for a year. You know, depending on where you lived. I mean, I mean, Florida has been wide open through most right. of this whereas New York has been shut down through most of this. So we've had totally different experiences depending on where you live. Certainly California was another state that was shut down significantly, uh, whereas Texas was wide open. Uh, So you you have, everybody's having like completely different experiences through the same crisis. Right. And and you have that no matter what it is, whether it was a Hurricane Sandy or whether it's, you know, a wildfire, or, you know, or a tornado where one house is destroyed and the house next to it is absolutely perfect and nothing happened to it. Yeah. So it's like, you know, that the experience of everybody in a disaster is going to be slightly different. Yeah. But yeah. The thing that I think most of us don't anticipate is how long it takes to recover right. following a disaster. Yeah. I mean, yeah. after two years of this economic disaster that we've had with the pandemic where a lot of people were depending on extra checks and extra money from the government to kind of keep them afloat and now those things are stopping and they have to get back into the workforce and now they're facing this crazy inflation right and you know we're watching the you know uh, i got a fifteen hundred dollar oil bill for my heating oil you know which a year ago was only seven hundred dollars so, yeah. you know, when you're on a fixed income, it becomes more and more of a challenge. Yeah. And you yeah. Making decisions as far as what you're able to do, and what you're not able to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, you know, 
I'm going to switch to you in a second, Don, and just before I, I do, though, I want to just mention that I think that, you know, one of the key things you guys have been talking about is when there's a crisis, depending on how deep the crisis is, that will also determine to some extent, you know, the length of the recovery. The, the tougher the crisis, the longer it takes to recover. It's almost a law of physics, you know, and I think that applies also financially sometimes. And I think that's why I think that, you know, when when you're dealing with economic uncertainty, I think that a lot of folks, um, uh, perhaps you as well, your advice is to sort of, uh, you know, uh, advise patience. You know, my last guest last week was actually an interesting show about you know, uh, psychologist Andrea Gould Marks talking about sort of the virtues and the skills of developing patience. And I think that's part of the issue here too, is like, it's not that you don't, may not do nothing, but be patient. It's gonna take some time even financially, right, Don? Yes, uh, actually, you know, <clears throat> speaking about that, you know, what you mentioned inflation, the fact that inflation is like uh, close to 8% right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think we have to be patient to use your words, uh, because this will this will pass once we get the, the supplies that we need, uh, inflation should start dropping and people hopefully have time on their side to, uh, to wait it out. Um, some retirees, unfortunately, that are being forced to take money right now don't have that luxury, but there are, there are ways around that. Um, but patience, yes, patience is, is very important. Right, right. Um, so let's uh, shift a little bit to, um, um, you know, some of the, the specifics about how you, how you do plan for crises, you know, whether it's, uh, well, again, I'll, I'll talk to you, Linda, some generally about some of your approaches and strategies and, and uh, ways of doing this, and then uh, talk to Don more specifically about some of the financial approaches to this. But uh, so talk a bit about your, your crisis planning approach here. Well, case you know, the first, first step is to recognize that you need to have a plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that having a plan is better than not having a plan. Right. I mean, if you don't have a plan, then that's when panic ensues and, and all the bad things happen. So having a plan, recognizing that, and now is the time to plan. If, not, if the pandemic didn't teach us anything, it's that anything can happen at any time to anyone. So let's recognize that having a plan is important. The second step is to figure out what you already have. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have no clue what they already have whether you have life insurance through work or disability through work, if you lose your job, you've lost those two coverages, your health insurance that comes through work. So you have to kind of anticipate, okay, what do I do if that happens? And, you know, and recognize that a disability plan through work is only going to pay 50% of your salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know when I, you know, when I had my pharmaceutical job, and my husband was disabled and I had to kind of think ahead. And so some of the things that I, you know, cause I was on the road every day, I was driving in Brooklyn and the Bronx and, you know, I was everywhere, you know? And I was like, okay, what if, it, what if I had a horrible car accident mm -hmm. and became disabled? And so I had a gap disability policy to, to fill that extra half of the income that I would have lost on long-term care disability. And then I also got a, a million dollar life insurance policy because I some if I died, my husband was disabled, I wanted him to be able to be taken care of. And then I also got my long term um, care dis, uh, policy, because the chances of me outliving him were very high. And getting that policy at a younger age, saved me a lot of money overall, because I, it didn't cost me as much in the premiums mm -hmm. as it would have if I had waited another 10 years. Right. And, you know, so it's like I planned ahead and it gave me the peace of mind right. to know that when I was on the road, I didn't have to worry about what if. Right. I knew that if something happened, I was covered and my right. husband was going to be protected. So right. that's the way you have to kind of think. So you kind of, what do you already have in place? what are you missing? And then fill in those gaps, right? Then organize it in one place so that 
your family or you can access it easily. You don't want to be sending your family on a scavenger hunt without a list. Right, right. And then finally, communicate the things that people need to know. They need to know if you have um, a long-term care policy. They need to know if you have a reverse mortgage. Right. They need to know if you have a, um, a prepaid funeral. Right. right. Those would be three essential things that your family should know. They right. should also know about your, your health care proxy and your living right. will and those kind of things so that those decisions they don't have to make because you've already made them. Right. And it takes that burden off your loved one. Two right. minutes till break. Two minutes. So okay. Those are the four steps, basically. Recognize you need a plan. Figure out what you already have and, and then fill in the gaps. Organize it. And finally, you want to communicate to your loved ones right. what they need to know. Right. Okay. Good. You know, it's funny you mentioned that about the planning piece. Every time my wife and I go away on vacation, we have a list that we leave behind for my son as a just in case mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. everything is. And a lot of people don't do that. And if they don't, they're lost if something happens to you. Right. Right. So it's important. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's something we don't, we don't think about, especially, uh, you know, we think about, sometimes we think about ourselves, but we don't think about our kids, you know, about the importance of that, you know, that, and I think for a lot of people too, and I'll get back to more of a financial piece with you early, uh, soon done, but, uh, you know, from a healthcare perspective, right. people know that, you know, when you're, when your children turn 18, they need their own healthcare proxies and mm -hmm. people don't recognize that. So when they go off to college, that's one thing they've got to do. So, um, so listen, I think we're going to, uh, we're going to get to you done to get, I want to get into some more specifics about the financial side of things, but we need to take a quick break. Uh, we'll be back soon, folks. We'll be talking much more with Linda Fostek and Don Patain. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back, folks. We're talking with Linda Fostek and Don Patain, both veterans in their fields. Linda, a crisis management planner, Don, a financial advisor. We've been talking to them about how we recover from COVID uh, and uh, prepare for future crises in our lives yet unknown. Uh, now, before we continue our conversation, I want to just let you know that you can find out more about my guests by going to my website, roelresources.com, clicking on the 45 forward tab, as well as find go to their website. So Linda's website is lindafostek.com, Linda, F-O-S-T-E-K.com. And Don's uh, website is Main Street dash financial group.com right i got that right guys that's right okay good good so as we were going to the break i wanted to switch over to don and have uh, you talk a bit don about the financial planning side that works in conjunction with linda's stuff you know both in general planning but also some of the crisis planning the elements of that well generally what i do is uh when i sit with somebody i take a look at what they have mm -hmm. what and what they may want to be accomplishing Right. And um, and I move forward from there. There are some people I that um, I if they have absolutely nothing I can work with, then I basically tell them they have to make sure they can live every day. Um, but uh, but they also I also tell them you may want to do things, but you also again that wording live every day. You can't be putting away money and, and, and not being able to eat. Right. So uh, it's important. So uh, those people that do have something to work with, I generally tell them they should have a, an emergency fund that would last anywhere from three to six months in case right. something were to happen. Uh, and then as far as investments go, they should have uh, short-term investments and long-term investments. They should have buckets of money that um, are maybe not as aggressively invested uh, for the near term. And then for those that are maybe 10 years out, uh, have more aggressive investments because it gives it time for the market and so on to be able to, um, to gain. Right. Um, and uh, it's important that you have that. You have the buckets of money, uh, right. not just all, all your stuff in one place. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, I think one of the things that is... Uh... It's tough. I, it was something I had to be careful and watch for too, is this emergency fund, this three to six month emergency fund. It's something that can slip by easily. I know I've talked to Linda about this too. It's just like people just like, ah, you know, just keep going month to month. I think that's one thing that people 
you know, are shocked to realize if something happens unexpectedly, it's like, holy smoke, you know, uh, you know, and I think that early parts of the pandemic showed that how many people were living month to month without any savings at all, without any, any cushion to, to think about that. Um, so you, I see you're nodding, Linda, talk to me more. Well, and, and it was even, some people were week to week. Right. I mean, they literally, until their unemployment came through or whatever, they had no food in their refrigerator. They, you know, and especially when the schools were closed and some of these families were used to having breakfast and lunch provided for their children and suddenly that stopped right um and they had no income coming in because their job evaporated because their business was shut down um it had to be very scary for a lot of people right right yeah yeah i think that um you know i i think that i think we you know we we do you know, hope for the best, but I think as you guys know, you, yes, you hope for the best and plan for the worst. That's the, that's the, the framework we need. Um, and, and of course, you know, with different kinds of investments, long-term, short-term there, you know, I'm sure that Don goes through uh, sort of assessing people's, um, you know, their, as they call it, their risk profile. <laughs> People Exactly. That's, that's one of the things that's important. You have to know their risk profile. Um, and also you have to I have some people that, that really want to do a lot for their kids. For example, they want to do the college planning and put money away. And I tell them, you know what, before you do that, you should consider your own retirement because mm -hmm. your kids are not going to fund your retirement. Right. Uh, and the kids could possibly get scholarships, grants, whatever may be going on. But you need to think, and I, sometimes I tell them, you're not being selfish. You need to think about yourself right. and, and plan for your retirement. And then once you do that, if you have extra money left over, you can put some away for the kids. Right. Um, it's important. Um, yeah. And, and you, as far as putting away for the kids, you know, the college planning, start early if you can, because the more time you have on your side, the better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, the, another common metaphor that I know you guys are familiar with is, you know, the, the flight attendant, you know, metaphor, right. You know, in case put of your mask uh, on first. put your mask on first, exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. and I, and it's important for your kids because in later on, <laughs> the, you know, the whole issue of long term care as yes, you get older becomes an issue, and you better be prepared first for, to handle that. Uh, you know, the, I, I think they'd appreciate your being prepared for that more than you know having you know prepare for them when this is the immediate thing they that that doesn't fall on them because otherwise if you're not prepared, that's what will happen to them. So well, that turns out that it's the family, it's the, that sandwich generation where, you know, you're caring for your parents. Uh, let's say people that are, that are our age would be caring for your, your parents and you have kids. So you're right in the middle there and you see what's been going through with your parents. In many cases, the parents have not had long-term care insurance and you've seen what you have gone through. So what happens is that it, it's an eye opener that it makes you want to make sure that you get it. Right. So that right. your kids don't have that burden because it does become a major, a major problem. Right. Right. And right. that and even goes for the pre-planned funeral as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, how yeah. many people make decisions at, you know, in the funeral parlor and spend more money than their parents would have wanted them to spend. Right. And, you know, because they're feeling guilty or they just, they don't know what they're doing and you know they get this ridiculous bill for a funeral that maybe they didn't have to spend that much money and if you know having the prepaid funeral takes all those decisions out of the hands of the people that are grieving for you yeah and it makes it so much easier i know my parents both had prepaid funerals and it made such a difference for my my sister and i we didn't have to deal with making those decisions yeah and uh, you know and my my parents also had long-term care insurance which my father didn't use a single day of and so all those premiums were for nothing because that was a traditional long-term care policy which a lot of them now are hybrid where you can actually right. um, have a life insurance policy combined with a long-term care policy so it has value if right. you die before you use it 
but my mother used all but three months of her long-term care policy. Mm -hmm. And she was in the Bristol memory unit, um, absolutely had top-notch care. And it took so much off of my sister and I, knowing that she was well cared for and she was in a really, really good place. And, you know, we had minimal expenses above and beyond that because her long-term care policy covered everything. Right. She right. passed away three months before she would have run out of long-term care because right. she was in there for almost five years. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know, Don, you also, you, you work with a, a, lot, a lot of other professionals. So I think that's an important dimension, right? In terms of how you collaborate with other professionals who may not be financial advisors, but, you know, you can collaborate and kind of coordinate. We have a, uh, I have a great network of people that, that that I have known through various organizations that actually both Linda and I belong to, and uh, you have the home care agencies, you have the assisted living facilities, you have the people that move help people move out of their homes and uh, into a facility. Um, it, it, it's a it's a great network of of referral because sometimes, you know, it's it's great to not you can't. You can't know everything. Uh, so by knowing people that are specialized in those particular fields, mm -hmm. you feel very comfortable referring them. If somebody has a question about a home care agency or if they, they're looking for a place to place their mom or, or, or dad or whatever, you know people you can speak with uh, right. that can help them. Right, right. And it's, it's, a great, it's a great network. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and, and also everything includes everything from home and and in in-house occupational therapy and physical therapy and right. you know home dental care i mean like who knew that there was a traveling dentist that could come and do dental right care right. At, in somebody's home but you find all these amazing connections by you know by being involved in in organizations that that really do support that and national aging and place council is one right. of those organizations it's not a networking group but right. it is a network of resources right and everybody in that group is vetted and you know background checked and you know so that you can deal with anybody in that group and there are uh chapters around the country right right that truly that serve the areas around them in such a way that really can help people because you don't know what you don't know right. until you need it right <laughs> you know and then yeah. it's like how do i get help where do i go right and it's, it's just a really easy place to make a, a one phone call and they can connect you with right. all the services that you need yeah i think it's important for our, our listeners to know about this so it's a national aging place council naipc and as linda mentioned uh so there's a chapter where we are that we're involved in. It's a resource group, uh, NAIPC, but people can find these organizations across the country. And that is a, a real concern because I'm sure you guys, you know, run into people all the time and their, their first comment is, I don't know where to start. And so this is, and, and it, sometimes it's not clear where to start exactly because there are different issues that are bundled. So it, you can contact this, the NAIPC in your area and at least start getting referrals and, and getting information about the, just listing the different areas of expertise is a valuable thing that I found. So I, I well, would, uh, go ahead. I interject Don. something. Sure. I had, one, I had a, uh, actually a neighbor who was asking me for a friend. Um, she was going to be calling a couple of the assisted living facilities looking for someone that can help her. And I actually then suggested going to one of the one of the people that we know that can, it's a one-stop shop mm -hmm. where you call this gentleman and he will find a place based on your needs. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to do any of the research. He'll do it all and then refer you to those locations. Right. It's a great service. Right. And it's not always the closest location to you. Right. It may be, you know, that may not be the best fit because you're, you're looking for, the, the social interaction, the ethnic interaction, all, you know, he'll, they will actually interview the, the person that's being placed as well as the family to find out what does this person, you know, what does the person being placed like to do? 
are, you know, what are they interested in? What is their background? You know, where, you know, where does their family come from? So that there's, they find the perfect fit for you. And, right. you know, instead of you ending up someplace where, you know, you're not happy, <laughs> you know, because right. the bottom line is that, and, and they don't charge the, 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 um, the client at yeah. all. Yeah. 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 I think that, you know, you're, you're pointing out some, some very good um, uh, thoughts here, which is that part of being prepared for crises is not only being prepared from a, you know, from a content perspective or an issues perspective, but knowing who to go to when you're ready to, or you, you need to find these individuals. And I think that's an area of crisis planning and preparedness that people don't think about. Well, who are the people out there? I mean, so yes, um, and sometimes, you know, many people do have, you know, elder law attorneys, uh, financial advisors and so forth, but sort of networking that these groups together or just having conversations with them saying, listen, who do you know in these areas? You know, can you, can you start me off with some recommendations so I can at least start checking it out? Because I think that's, um, I, I, I forget your exact wording, Linda, but you had a phrase about knowing people before you know you have to know them. Oh, or to be known before you're needed. Right, right. And and that I think is very important. And, and that's one of the things that we do is that we do a lot of community outreach as well, where we do, we put together um, presentations at libraries and at various senior centers and things like that, where we introduce people to the whole array of services that are available so that they know, first of all, who to call. And it's a simple one, one call does it all. All they have to do is call NAICC mm -hmm. and they can be connected to any right. of the services. But to be known before you need it and know that there are things available that can help you out when you need it. Right. Um, you know, my, my friend's father has had surgery in right after Thanksgiving. Um, it was a reconstructive surgery for his bowel because he mm -hmm. had a bowel obstruction a year earlier. And following the surgery, he had a stroke. I mean, so his recovery has been horribly complicated. Right. Um, and, you know, he was in the hospital, then they sent him to rehab, then he ended up back in the hospital and then back in rehab. But he was absolutely miserable in rehab. And the family made a decision that they needed to take him home. Right. Well, now you need a hospital bed, a Hoyer lift, a, 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 you know, you need all these, all these physical things to move him and to handle him because he's still recovering from the stroke, but they needed occupational therapy and physical therapy. And, you know, they, they needed to make arrangements to get him to a doctor's appointment because he couldn't get into a car or out of a car. Right. So all of those things were made available to them by being able to make one phone call. Right, right. And, yeah. and, and kind of say, okay, this is what we need. And, and we also need some help with um, somebody to be with him. Yeah. Overnight. Two minutes till break. Two okay. minutes. Yeah. So, yeah. I think so. From the professional perspective, it's important to um, be known before you're needed. And then from the consumer's perspective, the, the flip side is important to know people like you before that you're needed. Uh, because it's trying to, you know, find you find you in, in the midst of a crisis is tough, you know, so and often you don't make the right decisions because you're doing it. Let's repeat that word in a panic. Yes. <laughs> Never yes. a good idea. Um, so, Don, I wanted to ask you, uh, I think we're going to uh, come to a break shortly, but I want to at least start the conversation about in terms of how long we should plan, because I think one of the issues, right, is longevity which is sort of, we talk about, you know, the bonus years of, uh, of increased health and wellness and planning and so forth. But then it's like, okay, um, uh, I guess the, the question people, you know, put it bluntly is, will I outlive my money? So how long do you, you plan for people generally? I actually plan for their life, their lifetime. And mm -hmm. there, there are different things out there, different solutions that are out there that will allow you to get income for life mm -hmm. uh, similar to pensions there's not too many pensions out there anymore no. but this this one particular option will give you a pension like income as long as you're alive and so uh, 
the insurance companies, uh, <laughs> they don't really like that idea, you know, but they, it's something that they, they was, got very competitive a few, about 10, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they decided to come up with these solutions right. to uh, will people to invest with them. Right. And it's one of those buckets. It's not a bucket that it's for everybody, but it's one of those buckets that will give you a lifetime income in right. addition to regular investments that give you dividends and yields and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, right. You just have to pay attention to that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's no specific uh, uh, time clock, but I think, uh, you know, for me, I'm looking at a hundred. <laughs> will I make? Will I make it? We don't know. But the, you do well, see a lot of stories about. Uh, my father numbers. lived until ninety-seven. Yeah. Hey, my uh, neighbor's mother seconds. just passed away at one hundred and three, and she was still doing stairs and was sharp as a tap right up until when she exactly. passed away. So. Exactly. All right, folks, we're going to uh, just uh, stop right here for a moment, take another short break. Uh, but when we come back, don't 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 go away, folks. We have much more in our last segment with Linda Fostek and Don Patain. Welcome back, folks. Once again, we're talking with Linda Fostek and Don Patain about preparing and managing crises in our lives and communities. And now, before the break, we were talking a lot about sort of individual preparedness, um, but implicit in that is an understanding that crisis preparation really involves a team and often a community approach. So um, Linda has a whole other segment of her um, uh, activity that deals with uh, community preparedness and recovery. So let's, let's start with you, Linda, about, you know, your involvement in this. Well, you know, it, you know, when you talk about community involvement, it's, it's really about realizing that we're not alone in this boat, that we have neighbors and right. friends and everybody else that could also need some help. And it's about being part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And one of the things that I've, um, you know, my parents delivered meals on wheels into mm -hmm. their 80s to the quote unquote old people. <laughs> right, I mean, they were right. in their 80s and they're delivering meal on, meals on wheels. Um, they were both healthy and they were able to do it. And it was just something that they did every week. Um, and I mean, they had a friend who was um, in a long-term care facility. They visited her every week. Um, you know, because they wanted to keep that connection. And it's like when, when we have a horrible snowstorm, I have a guardian angel on my block, literally, because this young man who's in, in junior high school, he comes and he plows my driveway and clears off my car and he won't take any money because mm -hmm. as part of their school program, they are supposed to do community service and this is part of his community, his give back to the community is that he does take care of a few of the aging neighbors. I guess I'm in that category now. Right. Um, you know, the aging neighbors. And I am so grateful for this guardian angel because when it snows, I don't have to worry. Am I going to be able to get out of the house? Um, he takes care of everything. But right. in my own give back is I'm part of an organization called CERT. Mm -hmm. which is the Community Emergency Response Team. And following Katrina, FEMA realized that they needed to get the community more involved in recovery following disaster. And so they developed this community response team. And there are chapters in every state, in every county across the country. So people can become part of certified members of CERT and they do all kinds of training, everything from first aid to um, sheltering, to search and recovery, to, all, I mean, fire suppression. I mean, we've done all kinds of training um, and you know, you're like, okay, well, how does that play in the community where I live? Well, you know, we assist at parades and we, you know, we, at various events like mm -hmm. the Cow Harbor day race, we assisted with that, but, during the pandemic, we were called on early on in the pandemic to help distribute the, uh, the personal protective gear to nursing homes and assisted livings. I mean, when they didn't have masks and they couldn't get gowns and they couldn't get any of that stuff and the county was able to secure supply, 
So we were making, I was making phone calls to all of these places saying, I've got N95 masks. How many do you need? And you can come pick them up today. And, you know, and I mean, I could hear the people on the other end of the phone doing a happy dance because they had, they were washing and reusing Mm -hmm. their N95 masks because they didn't have a choice. Um, And then later on in the pandemic, once the um, vaccine became available, we were called on to assist in the distribution of the vaccine in, in, in a logistics sort of way. Right. We weren't actually giving the shots because they had professionals doing that, but we were facilitating the logistics, keeping the lines moving, organizing, you know, getting people in and out in a, an efficient manner. Um, and I did that every week for over six months. I was, I was assisting with the right. vaccine distribution yeah. Yeah. and, to the point where I always worked in the afternoon and many afternoons at three o'clock, I would go check with them and say, well, how many appointments didn't show up? Um, I have a couple of people that are having a different right. time getting an appointment because right. either they didn't have a computer or just couldn't do it. And, you know, I was able to get some of my neighbors who were in their eighties and, right. you know, in to get their vaccine right. and, you know, just being able to do that. Right. That give back feeling like you're part of the solution. Right. It's, it feels so wonderful to be able right. to do that. Yeah. Now I know that Don too, in a very, in a different way, but you're involved in organizations like the Kiwanis and the Lions Club and a counseling center. So you, yes. Yeah, so your business is, you know, financial advising, but you're also involved in a, in community efforts and recognizing it's not just about a network being in a network. No, I, I belong to a lot of organizations. The uh, I'm heavily involved also with my my local Levittown Chamber of Commerce. Mm-hmm. And um, what one of the things we did during the pandemic was to uh, go around to our businesses and and do uh, either take a picture or taking a video clip and doing an article on them and putting them into our newsletter uh, on the on, on our website to. Uh, to let people know that they were, we call it our still standing program. Mm-hmm. So that, right. and it's many, many, many uh, businesses were struggling and we wanted to try and advocate for them. And that's one of the things we did. Um, right. We, we, um, we also, well, with Lions and Kiwanis, a lot of it closed <clears throat> down during the, uh, during the pandemic. But, uh, but one thing was what Linda was saying was the fact that, we also got our hands through the county on on masks and and um, hand sanitizers and so on, and we were distributing those also to the businesses. Right. And uh, I'm also involved with the, at the the Nassau County level with the Nassau Council of Chambers of Commerce, and they were getting stuff that we were filtering down through the uh, to the chambers. Right. And giving giving stuff out that was needed. We had our lo- a local printer. Actually, I helped donate to a 3D printer that he he, he wanted to buy a second one. That was he was making face masks mm. and wow. and supplying them to Nassau Medical Center. So it, everybody was kind of like working on this to try and make things work for the, for the local the local people. Yeah, and yeah. um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that yeah, a lot of stuff you know it comes from different levels, you know, but ultimately, you know, like real estate, it's local, local, local. And I think that one of the things that, you know, that comes to mind when I hear the two of you talk about this is that, you know, you you can't avoid a lot of crises, but you can prepare and you develop what I sort of call, you know, crisis hardiness (laughs) or resilience, you know, that's a word a lot of people use these days. But what does that mean? It means being connected in the community like you guys are and, and being available um, uh, when things come up. And I think just all an overall recognition that um, in order to solve a lot of these things, you need what I call the, a three-legged stool. I mean, it's, it's business, it's government at different levels, and it's nonprofit and volunteer efforts. And you really need everybody involved in these mm-hmm. situations. You know, and you need a, to be cloned also. <laughs> well, well, you guys I, need to be cloned. You know, for me, what I, I think <laughs> what happens is when you're involved as part of the solution, you forget about your own problems. Mm -hmm. You know, somehow it makes whatever you're going through seem small when you look at it from what the perspective is that the community needs your help. Right. And when you're giving back in that way, 
you're you feel like you're contributing something positive to what otherwise is a horrible situation and you see that all the time you know you see it following a tornado when the neighbors come and they help clean out the house mm -hmm. or you know after a hurricane and everybody's working together to try to get things back together um you know it's like you suddenly don't you know you're not alone right and when you don't feel like you're alone in your struggle somehow it lightens the burden right yeah yeah. And I think it really makes you feel part of something, you know, that sense of belonging is really critical. I remember in, in my neighborhood, when we all experienced hurricane or a super storm stand, Sandy, I guess it was a characterization of it. Boy, that was really something that hit us hard. It was unexpected. Um, and I remember, you know, I guess the, the, the soil was really wet. So there was a tremendous amount of tree damage and falling trees. And there was a, you know, so there were some trees um, across the road that made it in front of our house, made it impassable. Um, and some of that, we, you know, it was like, well, I'm not touching that because there were power lines and so forth. But there was one area where, you know, there, there wasn't any particular uh, hazard um, and uh, at least, you know, electrical and so forth. Um, and I just got out there with a bunch of neighbors. And I said, listen, you know, let's just help clear this. You know, I mean, we're not going to solve the problem, but, you know, it's the system is overwhelmed. So do what you can. Let's do what we can. Let's, you know, bring out the chainsaws. We can take care of this. I think some of the locals were a little surprised, but we're like, hey, you got to you got to pitch in. You got to pitch in, as you said, Linda, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and we can do it, you know. So I think that, you know, one thing you guys have mentioned is the sense of giving back. And I think that gratitude is certainly important and is part of the, the formula for managing crises. And I, the last thing I wanted to just mention, because I think both of you, in my experience with dealing with you, ex exhibit this, and that is a sense of humor. <laughs> you got to be able to laugh at the face of disaster, and and because you're going to find yourself in ridiculous situations, and if you can't laugh at it and release some of that tension, it it, it will overwhelm you. Yeah, I had something in particular that used to happen. Well, it's still happening now. I started in the pandemic on Facebook. I was usually very quiet on Facebook. I would like say I liked this or that. That's right. about it. And then all of a sudden something happened during the pandemic where I started seeing a few cartoons here and there. Uh -huh. yeah, and I started posting them, but I didn't just post them. I also commented on them mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm getting and I'm still doing it. it it's mm -hmm. kind of like I've become addicted to it. And, and people are, are always coming back to me and say, I love your comments. Mm -hmm. And I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. It was a release, right? you know? So right. it's still a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, and so many people have lost their sense of humor. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you, you need to be able to find the ridiculousness of the situation because often it is a ridiculous thing that's happening and you're like right. i can't believe how do i deal with this and then you have to find something that will make you laugh and you know and sometimes you laugh at the stupidest thing but releasing that that two minutes till close two energy minutes. really really makes a difference right yeah i agree I, you know when i listen to uh, speakers which is quite often i, I think to myself well, what makes this person so compelling and it, it's their, their sense of humor you know they can bring a sense of humor and levity to even difficult situations and i think it it really helps to carry us through so speaking of carrying us through we are unfortunately at the end of our program but i just uh, want to thank you two for uh, a terrific program really informative uh inspirational in many ways um so uh so first thank you linda and don for a great show um, and, uh, before we, uh, close, I just want to listen, let people know if they want to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you, Linda and start again. Well, they can reach me at Linda Fostek at the crisis planner.com. Okay. Very easy. And that's F O S T E K. Right. And, and Don, do you, uh, they can email me at D Patain. That's D P A T A N E at M is in Mary, S is in Sam, F is in Frank, G is in George dot info. 
Okay, good. And I know that people can also find you guys on, on Facebook and, and right. LinkedIn as well. So yeah. they can look for you there. Um, yeah, so once again, folks, uh, tell your friends if they missed my conversation with Linda and Don today, and they can listen to it as a podcast on voiceamerica.com to search for my show, 45 Forward. You can also find it on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, our heart radio. Go to my website, roboresources.com. Uh, you can find uh, the podcast on there after, the, after we uh, uh, complete the show today. Uh, and you can also take my retirement mentality quiz. It's a 25-point checklist to see how prepared you are for the second half of life. So be sure to join me next Monday at 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time, when I'll be talking with Guido Durley, who's the founder of Emix uh, Senior Services. And uh, he'll be talking about his specialization, which is preparing for long-term care when you the best option is applying for Medicaid programs. So until then, folks, keep moving forward, 45 forward. 